where have I been? Well, I'm still here and my YouTube channel is still alive and kicking and back in action. The reality, I'm afraid, is that I've just been massively busy running workshops, uh, writing books. I published two books since the autumn and I've just finished writing a third. And last year I ran 79 street photography workshops. I've just not had time to even think about producing YouTube videos. But things are now a bit more back to normal and I've got a new format for these videos. So with each video, and I'm aiming for one every month, there'll now be one main topic, a big issue if you like, a core subject, and that'll be supported by other material, magazine style. So what I'd really like to do here is bring you into the conversation a bit more and make this more of a community. So content for future videos could include book reviews, uh, image critiques, uh, tips, techniques, stories about your zines and books, and each month I'll do uh, a QA and a with your questions. There may be a little bit about gear, but that's not really what this channel is all about. Certainly no unboxings, no gear reviews, but maybe a bit of news and opinions about gear. And all this is why I've renamed this channel the Street Photography Club, because that's what it is. Think of it as your street photography community on YouTube. And it's supported by a Facebook group, an active Facebook group, look for the Street Photography Club, and an Instagram account, the Street Photography Club. And I'll put links in the description below for you. So we're gonna start off today's video with uh, one of your questions. And the first one is from Camille in Philadelphia, who asks, how can I make money from street photography? Well, the short answer, Camille, is with great difficulty. There's actually a really small market for people who want to buy street images. And those who do are just not willing to pay much for them. So unless you're a big name, uh, you're probably not going to make much from, from print sales. Harsh, but true. And that's the reality, I'm afraid. But you could then uh, shoot street photography for commercial clients. And I'm now doing more and more of this myself. And this works when you have a, an art director or an agency who just gets street photography and they think it could bring a, a campaign to life. And this is quite exciting. But if you're not well known, the opportunities for this are quite rare. Then there are books and zines. And if your material is strong enough, people will buy them. But I think to do this effectively, you need a good following. And this means getting your work out there. But it's certainly possible. Then there are workshops, but please don't buy into the idea that because you can take good pictures, you'll automatically be a good teacher and it's easy to run workshops. It's not necessarily the case. And you need to do both of those things very well. And there aren't many people who tick that box. I know quite a lot of people who can do one or the other, but not necessarily both. So in short, making money out of this is, is never going to be easy. And I, I, I certainly wouldn't give the day job, give up the day job. I hope that answers your question, Camille. So let's get into the meat of this month's uh, street photography video. And in this video, we're going to dispel some of the myths of street photography and explore some of the realities. And if there's an, an elephant in the room, we'll show him the door. As in all my videos, this is all based on my own personal opinion and my experience. And I'm not saying it's right or it's wrong. It just happens to be what I believe. As someone who teaches street photography for a living, it would be wrong of me to suggest that street photography is an easy ride. And yes, of course, you can just go out there and shoot anything on the streets. And yes, that's fine. Of course, it's street photography, even if it isn't. I know there are plenty of people who go down the route of shoot anything. Nobody cares about definitions. But I'm sorry, I just can't do that. We've really got to have some sort of framework to operate within or else street photography would just be a free for all. Uh, a cat on a wall is street photography. A picture of a bus is street photography. A picture of somebody's lunch is street photography, which, of course, none of them are. And by the way, at some point, I'll produce a separate video about what is and what isn't street photography. Uh, and yes, I know that's going to bring a lot of controversy into, into the argument, and that's fine. We're talking about my opinions here. So we won't dig too deeply into that divisive question in this video, but we'll look at it again in the future. 
So what I'll be trying to get across in this video is that street photography isn't necessarily easy. And if you do find it very easy, either you're shooting the wrong stuff or you're the best street photographer who ever lived. But if you can calibrate your expectations and accept that if you want to be really good at this, you need to be in it for the long term and you need to see it as a journey. With the right approach, the right mindset, the results will come. So let's probe a little more deeply into some of the realities of street photography. Firstly, it's hard work. You will take many, many, many boring pictures. And in the words of the great Alex Webb, street photography is 99.9% .9 about failure. What a great quote. It's a long journey and it's a hard journey and there'll be lots of failure, lots of mistakes, self-doubt. Is it all worth it? Why do I bother? But this is like building a, mu a muscle. The more you exercise it, the stronger it gets. A lot of people will fall by the wayside because they can't accept this. They can't get over the pain barrier. They're not prepared to put in the hard miles to make it work. So what I'm really getting at here is that if you are going to make this work, you won't do it without a stronger work ethic. Steps plus practice equals keepers. There's a strong correlation here. Next, and this is something we, we hear a lot of, and you probably don't want to hear this, but confrontation will happen. You can expect confrontation on the streets. It's a given. It happens. But once you get your head around accepting that it's occasionally going to happen, it's really a big deal. Just be nice out there. Be open. Be relaxed about what you're doing. Don't skulk around furtively and you'll have relatively few problems. If you're the, the nice guy out there, people will reflect that behavior back to you. Uh, so why, why be the kind of defensive, nervous, uh, uh, closed street photographer who's kind of pushing back on everything? Just be nice, be warm, be nice, be friendly. It will take you a long way. And I made a video a while ago about building your confidence on the streets and I'll pop a link up here. Instagram can hold you back. There, I've said it. And again, you probably don't want to hear this. The big danger I see with many street photographers is that they set out to please Instagram, which is totally the wrong way round. I kind of get it. I know that a certain type of image will get more likes and more vacuous, meaningless emojis than another type of image. I can even tell you what kind of image that is. It has simplicity. It's easy to digest in two seconds. And it's likely to be more what I would call lightscapes or minimalist street photography than what you might call traditional observational street photography, which I think is often harder to digest in such a short time frame. You've got to remember that Instagram has a really short attention span and you've got to hit somebody with something they can comprehend easily in a few seconds. But if you shoot specifically to get adoration from what is uh, a, a very fickle audience on social media, then I think you're shooting for all the wrong reasons. You really should be doing this for you. And I did a, uh, a video on this subject a few years ago. Again, I'll pop a, uh, a link up here to it. And I think I'll probably do an updated version of this at some point soon because the world's changed since then. We have we have new kids on the block like Vero, which I think is a very good alternative to Instagram, but it's early days. So stick around. I will do something about this shortly. And here's another elephant in the room, gear. Gear doesn't really matter. Pretty much any camera will do and you don't need expensive gear to be good. Look, I'm, I know a guy who shoots film on a, a little old Olympus trip like this that's worth about 50 quid. And you know what? His images are way better than another guy I know who shoots with a seven grand Leica. So don't make the gear an excuse. OK, good, good gear. We all know good gear can, can, can sometimes help a little, like, like shooting in low light, for example. But it's not really ever going to make you a better street photographer. Use what you've got, get to know it inside out and let it become part of you. 
This will be a far richer experience than constantly buying new stuff and not using the gear that you've got uh, and the gear that you're familiar with. So next up, uh, and I, I kind of alluded to this in the introduction, you've really got to manage your expectations as a street photographer and please don't go out there expecting to come home with loads of great keepers because it's not going to happen. Take great street photographers like Marowitz or Meyer or even Leiter. I reckon they'd be over the moon with one strong image or every, every week or so, maybe every month. And those guys shot a lot. And this is pretty much where your expectations should be. And look, if I go out shooting tomorrow, I'll be happy to come home with a keeper or two. Sometimes it's none and that's fine too. Do you know what? I, I'll have walked 30,000 steps. I'll have drunk loads of decent coffee. I'll have had a beer or two. I'll have had a few interesting conversations. I might have popped my head into a gallery. And whatever pictures I took, whatever the result, I'll have had a great day. Beware the street photographer who says to you, I went out shooting yesterday and I got loads of bangers, whatever they are. And when I was at school, bangers were sausages. My next point is really about your street photography journey. As you're learning, you'll be taking lots of inspiration from other street photographers, great. So whether it's the, uh, the greats like Winogrand or Herzog or Levitt or people you like on Instagram, but at some point you'll need to cut yourself free and go your own way. And I say this because it's something we should all be at least thinking about early on in that journey. Now, I'm not saying you need to reinvent the wheel. There are plenty of existing conversations going on out there. You simply need to take some of them off in a different direction and add your own spin, add your own take, your own angle onto street photography. Don't just copy what other people are doing. And we see this all the time. You know, a street photographer will go to a great location, say in London, Oxford Circus is a great example. The next minute, Instagram is flooded with pictures, all shot in Oxford Circus, that all look the same. OK, we know that most things have been done before, but you should aim to be inspired by others, but not be derivative. Look at, for example, uh, Nick Turpin's collective, In Public. That has set out to champion street photographers who are prepared to stick their neck out and take the genre in a different direction. And I love this thinking, do something new, do something original. Right, here's a controversial one, black and white. Should we shoot in black and white? Well, yeah, maybe we should. But one thing I've got to tell you, and this is a, a reality of street photography, black and white won't make a bad picture good. How often do you see somebody's image? Probably not a great one that's been converted to black and white to make it look more street. So you get home, you're looking through your pictures, uh, you find one, it looks a bit boring. Let's see if it works better in black and white. Okay, there's a small chance it will, but this is really upside down thinking. You really should be making the black and white decision before you press the button. So it should be an upfront creative choice, not an afterthought. Look, I, I, I've got no problem with black and white street photography. I shoot a lot of it myself and I absolutely love it. I would love uh, a monochrome camera. But at the end of the day, I think we've got to remember that black and white isn't reality. It's an abstraction. Sometimes it works great, but I think it needs to be done with a sense of purpose. All this, like everything else, is my own personal view, of course. I'm English, so I'll talk about the weather. The English love talking about the weather. Do you think you need good weather for street photography? Think again. All weather is good weather. Don't make the weather excuse an excuse for either taking boring pictures or not getting out there shooting. Yeah, of course, strong, strong sunshine is great. That's what we all look forward to. That's what we get out of bed for. But so is the rain the snow, the fog, the wind. I'm happy shooting in any kind of difficult weather because they all bring their own opportunities and nuances to street photography. 
Okay, a bland grey day is probably my least favourite, but I'll still get out there. Things still happen. My final point is about criticism. You will be criticised. Some people just don't get street photography. Some people don't get your brand of street photography. Some people think it's all too easy. Some, pe some have uh, something to prove. And you will occasionally get slated. Some people will not like your work, but that's fine. When I post a pic on Instagram and it gets negative comments, it's no problem. That's fine. I do this for me, not for you, not for the trolls, not for the critics, the keyboard warriors. I do it for me. And I can't let it get to me. Why people waste their time posting ne negative comments on social media beats me. Maybe it makes them feel better about themselves. Maybe they're just inadequate in some way. But you need to rise above it and so do I, and we need to block it all out. This is a long journey. There'll be lots of self-doubt. You'll make lots of mistakes. You'll have your own feelings of inadequacy, but you've just got to hunker down, dig in and do what you feel is right. So there we are, some realities of street photography for you. Let's talk about gear for a minute. I've been getting a lot of messages from people asking me if I'm still a Fujifilm ambassador. Well, no, I'm not. There was actually a cull of ambassadors at Fujifilm UK at the beginning of this year, and 13 of us were act, axed. In fact, I think it was pretty much all the, the, the existing ambassadors. And there are three new guys who have, who have come on board. Uh, nobody's really sure why this happened, but hey, it's, it's no problem. Life goes on. And we're, I think we're all busy enough doing other things not to have to worry about it. But this brings me to the question about gear. Do I still use Fujifilm kit? Yes, I do. It's a very good kit. Why wouldn't I? But because contractual restrictions have now been lifted, I'm allowed to use other gear too. And I, I'm just really enjoying it. I'm enjoying experimenting, playing around. Uh, as well as my Fujifilm stuff, I've got a little Ricoh GR3, which is fantastic. I've got a Leica Q2, which is even more fantastic. And I'm just loving the, the, the 28 mm lens. And although the, I found the Fujifilm X100V, very popular camera, uh, it was great for street photography, but as a manual focuser, as a zone focuser, I find the fly-by-wire lenses just a little bit awkward to use and that focus ring was too easily knocked out of position and you, you couldn't see the kind of barrel markings on, on the lens and all, all this doesn't really suit my way of working. So although I, th I think I probably had three of them, that camera was never really for me, uh, but that's just me. But the 28mm lens, I, I just find the, the, the fluidity and the expansiveness of 28mm really appealing. And I think it opens up way more possibilities for layers than the 35 or the 50 can. And then there's the, the, the proximity effect you get from the 28. The intimacy and the, the feeling of connection you get from being a, a few feet closer to your subject. Now I know the 28mm focal length isn't for everybody. But I do suggest you try it. It may take a bit of getting used to, but persevere. Don't give up on it too quickly. Uh, give it a go and let me know how you get on. I'd love if you if you're not used to the 28 mil, and I'm talking about 28 in full frame terms here. So uh, 18 on a crop sensor. Uh, if you give it a go, give me a shout. Let me know. I'd love to hear how you're getting on with it. But finally on this don't you don't expect to to hear me saying that suddenly that fujifilm gear is rubbish uh because it isn't it served me very well for many years uh, and it's great stuff but sometimes things just need to move on so that's all for today folks i, I hope you enjoyed the new format and i hope to see you again next time for more of the same and a feature about william Klein and specifically what we can all learn from him and how we can bring his thinking and his creative approach into our own street photography. We'll also be looking at your zines. Uh, we'll take some of your questions. There'll be a book of the month and I will dissect one of your images for uh, a critique. 
It's been great to be back. Uh, thank you for watching. I'll always finish these videos, by the way, with a favourite quote. And this one is from, uh, if I pronounce this correctly, Charolampos Kidonakis. The more I shoot, the more I realise what I want from photography. And at the same time, I get more confused about what I want. How true is that? See you next time.